All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am joined today by Serena Weaver, who is a school psychologist for children with special needs. And she is coming to us today to talk all about children on the spectrum, what that means, and to help us learn a little bit more about autism as it relates to sleep, because I know that it is an area that is not often talked about and something I wanted to chat a little bit more uh, on today with Serena around, you know, just the overall information, education, and awareness of children who are on the spectrum. So Serena, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you here and I hope I introduced you okay. If you want to tell everyone a little bit more about your experience uh, and the work you do, that would be lovely. Hi, Courtney. I'm so excited to be here and talk to um, your uh, clients and uh, your team about autism and, and disorders. It's definitely that I feel is talked about or researched quite enough, but you know, we have, we do have lots of good information to share. Uh, my background is I actually started when I was working on my bachelor's in psychology, working with children on the spectrum. And, um, you know, as I continued through my graduate school program, uh, now I'm working in a school uh, that uh, services children with all kinds of disabilities, including children on the autism spectrum. Well, I appreciate you being here and sharing a lot of information with us because it's certainly something that I know I don't have a ton of experience in from an overall clinical standpoint. So it's going to be very helpful to, to learn more of the clinical side of things today as we've worked with a lot of families here at Tiny Transitions with different diagnoses and autism is one of them. And it's just one of those things I think it's a, a huge need for from an education standpoint out in the sleep world with tired parents. So I want to start with just helping families to understand what it means to be diagnosed as on the spectrum or autism spectrum disorder. So maybe just starting there with uh, really a basic definition around what that means from a clinical standpoint. So uh, children who are on the spectrum characteristically have difficulties with social skills and um, have typically have difficulty with communication, which can look differently. You know, for some children on the spectrum, they may have very little communication. With other children on the spectrum, they may be completely verbal and appear to speak normally, but they miss certain cues or particularly like um, any kind of language that's abstract, like sarcasm or some of like the nonverbal cues that we generally use when we're speaking socially with other people. And then typically there is a display of some kind of restricted focus or repetitive behavior. And, and like I was describing with the communication that can look very different, you know, for some children, that is what I think is classically seen in videos as like rocking or head banging or spinning objects. But with other children who are higher functioning, it can be an extreme focus on one subject such as trains or weather. And, you know, typically some of the hallmark signs is they're unwilling to change the subject or to talk about um, a subject that somebody else would like to talk about. Interesting. Okay. And I know alongside with the diagnosis of autism or a child being on the spectrum, we talk a lot about sensory processing right now. So I was someone who, when I heard that term immediately kind of went to on the spectrum. And I know that's not necessarily the case. And actually you and I had a conversation about this where you educated me a bit more about the sensory processing that all of us have, regardless of age. Uh, you know, it's something that we all have a different threshold for. Would you mind taking a few minutes to explain that? Cause I thought it was really valuable when we were chatting through it. Of course. So, you know, when you think about sensory processing, what you really need to think about first foremost is that everyone has sensory experiences, right? We all can touch, we can taste, we smell, we see, we feel. And, you know, when you think about yourself or the people you know, I'm sure you can identify things 
that you are either more sensitive to or less sensitive to. Like, for example, I'm not as sensitive to smells as my husband is. He can smell things way sooner than I can, but I am more sensitive to touch. When I am baking or cooking and my hands are messy, I cannot wait to wash them. Um, so, you know, we all have different levels of what we are, you know, under responsive to or over responsive to in terms of the input we're receiving from our environment. When we're looking at a disorder, it, we're looking at the that our um, how we're receiving information, sensory information is to such a degree um, that it kind of inhibits our daily functioning. Like for example, if you are so sensitive to noise that you can't be in a crowded area, that you're holding your ears because it's too loud for you, or you're changing your environment, then, then that's when we're looking at a disorder. Or if you're seeking some kind of input so much that you're changing your daily behavior and it's interrupting your daily life then that's what we're looking at as taking it from just kind of those things that we're sensitive to versus actually having a sensory processing disorder. That's interesting. You know, we were using the example uh, of nails on a chalkboard, you know, so I think for mm -hmm. me, it, it was like, I could have somebody do nails on a chalkboard all day and it doesn't bother me. The second somebody's nail touches a chalkboard, I think my husband's, you know, tail curls between his legs and he kind of runs across the room. So it is interesting, the different thresholds. Now, one of the other interesting things that you said to me at one point was that you can have a, a sensitive sensory threshold. And I'm sorry if I'm saying it incorrectly, but not be diagnosed on the spectrum or with a clinical diagnosis, just because you have sensory processing, right? Right. So you can be diagnosed with a sensory processing disorder, such as, um, you know, uh, being sensitive to touch or sound or light and not be on the autism spectrum, particularly, you know, if you have well-developed social skills, well-developed, you know, social communication. Um, but also most children on the spectrum um, have a sensory processing disorder as well. They typically are either what we call hyposensitive, meaning less responsive or hypersensitive, more responsive um, than other children their age. Okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. And so I guess from a diagnosis standpoint, right? At what point do parents who are sitting there going, huh, I'm not really sure, maybe my child is exhibiting some of these things, right? At what age are our children typically diagnosed or is it something a pediatrician could see or pick up on? I mean, from an age standpoint, obviously, you know, babies grow rapidly, right, into toddlers. So at what threshold is there sort of a red flag going up? So most pediatricians um, at some point in the well visit usually around a year or so, but it can vary with the pediatrician. You may fill out a form. You may remember filling it out with your own children. It's called the MCHAT. It's like a screening form to see, and it asks you questions about, you know, being uh, your communication, your social skills, how they respond to you. Um, and so the pediatricians, I feel like do try to screen, uh, but sometimes, uh, kids who are higher functioning and have lots of skills get missed in those screenings as a young child. You know, typically there are children who are diagnosed as early as infants that are severely um, disabled and, you know, aren't developing language like they should, aren't responding to touch as they should. But then there are also, you know, kids who aren't diagnosed until much, much later because it can look like other things sometimes, you know, particularly if you have a language disorder or speech disorder, you know, you typically don't have as well developed social skills because language is such a big piece of socially communicating that when it's hard for you or you don't understand or people don't understand you, which is incredibly frustrating, mm -hmm. you kind of shy away from that. So that's when it can be, but a little bit difficult to, you know, to determine that diagnosis. 
Um, developmental pediatricians are the ones that typically, you know, your if your pediatrician had concerns or parent had concerns you brought up with your pediatrician, they would most likely recommend that you seek out a developmental pediatrician um, that could look at that diagnosis with you or another option would be looking into your early intervention program if you're if your child is birth to three or three to five, and if they're in school, you know, contacting your guidance counselor, mm-hmm. your principal about an evaluation. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, now, obviously, we focus to sleep, right? So we help a lot of different families with a lot of different struggles at a lot of different ages around sleep. So I'm curious from your perspective, um, if you could talk to me a bit more about in the mind of a child with autism, right? and successfully pairing that with sleep coaching, what that looks like, right? I know children do well with the story mapping who are on the spectrum, right? Like getting through that story and they replay that story going into bedtime every night. And that story is written a certain way. So I believe you call it scribing. I don't want to, I don't want to mistake the words, but you rewrite the story basically for the child. And so sleep coaching with a child on, on the spectrum is is something that is beneficial for their cognitive and and emotional balance, I I think as well as something that's feasible to do if they have poor sleep hygiene as the result of autism. I know that kids with autism typically aren't developing melatonin the way children with a non-diagnosis do. So I often know supplementing melatonin is something that that pediatricians will do because of their lack of the ability to make it. But, you know, talk to me a little bit more about just the sleep side of things from a clinical perspective. So there are a lot of different um, things that impact a child on the spectrum's um, ability to sleep or to fall asleep, to stay asleep. You know, as we had spoke about before, you know, there's, if they have a lot of sensory processing issues, they may have a really hard time um, calming their body down to get ready for sleep. Um, their circadian rhythms, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of reasons as to why this is, but they tend to be a little bit off um, as compared to a um, neurotypical child. And in particular, what research shows is that not only do they have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, but also the amount of REM sleep seems to be a little bit less than their neurotypical peers. So Um, the quality of sleep is actually, you know, somewhat poor for them or can be, Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that's true for everybody. But I think that, you know, in most cases, when you can take something and make it part of their routine, and especially make it concrete, you know, and thinking about children who are on the lower end of the spectrum who may be nonverbal, you know, making a picture schedule of their bedtime routine, knowing and helping their body get ready for that sleep is coming is incredibly beneficial. And, you know, there is a lot of really good response to that. In addition to that, sometimes if there's sensory concerns, you can do some sensory manipulation with um, you know, some families like weighted blankets or weighted animals, or I've even seen like you know, uh, children who are looking for um, deep pressure input that may be wearing like under armor compression garments during the day. Parents have made kind of like a compression sheet for them you know, to kind of have that input that helps their body calm down and to know that they need to calm down. And the scripting that we were talking about Uh, we call them social stories, you know, that is something that would go along, I think, with, um, or I would recommend to go along with a schedule, you know, whether it be a visual or a verbal schedule of their routine, so that in their head, they can also replay, you know, this is what I do to get ready to sleep. When I sleep better, I feel better, my behavior is better, um, And because one of the things that they, the research has shown is that children on the spectrum who don't sleep as well, they see more of the repetitive behaviors and they see more tantrums because they're frustrated um, more easily. So, you know, they, they will feel better if they get a, you know, sleep, the sleep that they need and a good quality sleep. Mm -hmm. 
It's interesting. It's such an area of, I think, you know, just, uh, I think to a degree unknown, right? There's a lot of things mm-hmm. about it that are unsolved for, right? And then there's the component of every child's different with it. So that comes into play with how you respond and support a child who is diagnosed as uh, being on the spectrum or having autism spectrum disorder, you know, from a verbal and nonverbal standpoint, from a sensory processing standpoint. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the connection points for every child are going to be a little bit different and how we support a family, you know, are going to be different as well, depending on, you know, what is going on. I would say for a family who's potentially listening or watching this, that may be curious, like something seems amiss, but they're just not quite sure. What would the next steps be? You know, obviously I would assume to start with the pediatrician and have a conversation about some things that parents are noticing, or what are some things that, you know, a new parent might kind of be looking at going, Hey, is this a neurotypical type of thing or is something else going on? Um, in terms of the autism, like in terms of diagnosing an autism mm. spectrum or, or do you mean in sleep particular? Uh, just in diagnosing. Okay. So I think that, you know, one of the things like that you may notice right away is if um, they're not making eye contact with you, if you are trying to comfort them through touch like hugs or rubs and that feels uncomfortable to them. Um, Those are some of the early signs uh, playing with toys in a way that they're not intended to be played with. Um, You know, and when we say that, like, um, you know, sometimes they'll uh, move like a car back and forth the same way. Or if they're watching a video, wanting to watch the same part over and over again, like they'll literally kind of rewind and watch the same thing over and over again. Or if you just notice like when you have them with other kids and you don't feel like they're interacting with the other children, those are like the hallmark signs that I would say, you know, you should speak with your pediatrician. But generally like as a mom and as a clinician, you know, what I tell parents all the time is as the mom or the dad, you know your child best. You know, I know the diagnosis and I can help you, you know, work out what diagnosis might be appropriate or what interventions may be needed based on your child. But you know your child best. And really, you know, when you get a feeling that something is not right, or when you, you know, see your child with other children and you feel like something is not right, it, it is always my recommendation to talk to somebody, talk to your pediatrician, talk to other moms. If you you know, your pediatrician thinks it's fine, it's still not sitting with you, try talking to somebody else because you know your child best and you know when something is just not right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I'm so appreciative mm-hmm. to have you uh, join me today for this. I think it's very helpful to just from an education standpoint, Uh, start talking about it more and and help families who may feel a little bit confused or a little bit unsure. So hopefully we were able to do that today. Thank you very much, Serena, for joining. And I really appreciate your time and always look forward to our chats.